Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Burns, the minister for the Finley Church of Christ, and thank you so much for joining me for Walking with the Word. This is a program on Monday evenings to help us take God's Word, put it into our lives so that we can learn more about God, learn more about His Word, and find ways that we can change and develop a Christian lifestyle. Today we're going to be looking at something that I find to be really interesting. We're going to look at a theme of color painting a picture of God. And what I want us to do as we go through this lesson today is I want us to use 10 different colors, but we're not going to use red and green and blue as you and I think about colors. We're going to use 10 different facts for us to learn things about God, for us to make an idea, a concept, a picture of who God is, what God does, and how you and I can follow Him more closely in our lives today. So let's start off because we're on a course today to look at 10 different things. Here's our first color as we paint a picture of God. Number one, God is eternal. God is eternal. Psalm 90 verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. It is God who has always been there. It is God who designed all things. It is God who built all things. It is God who is eternal. You see, that's a concept that's hard for us to understand because all we know is beginnings and ends. When we think about our lives, we think about the beginning of our life and the end of our life. We think about that with everyone that we've known. Matter of fact, we think about folks so much in that way that it's almost sometimes consuming about how we think about life, a beginning and an end. In everything else that we know, we think about it in the fact of a beginning and an end. Think about the nations of this world, the countries, the leaderships of this world. It is constantly changing. Matter of fact, one man has famously said the only thing that's constant in this world is change. And that is very true. But see... God does not change in that realm. God is eternal. Before this world was ever formed, before this world ever existed, before everything came to truth, God was there. God is there. God is eternal. So as we paint this picture, here's color number one, the eternal nature of God. Here's color number two, God is unchanging. God is unchanging. It's Malachi 3.6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Oh, as you go to the Old Testament, you'll find something that's true, something that's kind of true about us from time to time. Uh, the people that followed God didn't always follow God. And God was always there to take care of His people. And there was something that was always true about God. He didn't change. I want to give you a few things about God that you and I need to understand that do not change about God. Number one, God does not change in His love for us. God has always had a love for man. You read it through the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament, it's still true today. Number two, God provides for man. Not only the spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places, the book of Ephesians tells us, but also in the fact that this world is still standing. Who do you think? keeps this world standing? Who do you think keeps it in motion? Who do you think planned it to continue? It's God. Here's number three. God is unchanging in His focus on eternity. From the very beginning in Genesis 1-1 to the very end of the book of Revelation to the day and age we live in now, it's all about the end. It's all about the eternity. Eternity is coming. And God is still concerned about eternity. So when we read this here in Malachi 3-6, For I am the Lord, I change not. It's still true today. So take that color. Take the unchanging nature of God and start making some brush strokes on that empty canvas to see who God is and what God has done. Here's the third thing. God is a spirit. John 4, 24, a famous passage. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God knows what you and I need. God knows what we need. God knows who we are. Matter of fact, God is the one that formed us. 
You go all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis. Let us make man after our image and after our likeness. God made us with a spiritual being. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God placed above everything else in this world, before everything else that he created, a spirit within man, a soul. That's what God has. That's the likeness of God. An eternal concept in that idea. And God is a spirit. That's who God is. But I want you to see something in this third picture of God. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're we're not here today to talk about worship, but understand something. You and I need to worship God because God is deserving. Here's this idea. God is a spirit. God created us to be like Him, and we can be with Him for all of eternity if we'll follow Him. Let's move to the fourth thing in these pictures of who God is and what God has done. Here's number four. God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. It's John 10, 17 through 18. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I received of my Father. It's Jesus in John 10 who is explaining what's going to happen to Him. And it's Jesus who's going to give His life. Matter of fact, we read about Jesus later on. It's just a chapter over in John chapter 11 where we read a verse. Matter of fact, you know it. I don't even have to tell you what it is. You can say it with me. It's two words. Jesus wept. Jesus, in that occasion, His friend had died. And certainly we understand the tears that Jesus shed for his friend. You and I have had friends and loved ones who have passed away. We feel the pain of Jesus in John eleven thirty five. 35. But it's Jesus who could go to Lazarus and say at that grave, Lazarus, come forth. It was Marshall Keeble who said he had to call his name out by name, specifically Lazarus, because if he didn't, all those in the graves would have come forth. You see, it was Jesus who had the power to bring those out of the grave. That's unreal to us. He's all-powerful. But it's deeper than that. It's John 10, 17 through 18. My Father loves me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Now listen to this. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, was all-powerful. He could lay his life down because he knew he would walk out of the grave. Really, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the crescendo of Scripture. It is the high point. It's the beautiful point. It's everything the Old Testament was looking forward to. And if we think about it, it's everything that we look back to. The time when Jesus truly showed the power that God had. God is omnipotent. Here's number five. God is omniscient. God is omniscient. It's 1 John 3.20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. God knows all things. We read earlier in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the things that God knows. And one of the most amazing things to me is God knows even down to the hairs of your head. Oh, what an interesting thought. I know that brings it down to a minute detail that doesn't really matter, but that is the depth of the things that God knows. God knows you. God knows your life. We need to take consolation in the fact that God is omniscient. He knows all things. 1 John 5.20 gives us that phrase, He knows all things. You and I can take comfort in the fact that God knows who we are, but listen to this, God knows what's going on in our lives. Look at the picture we're painting. God knows you, God knows me, and He knows what's going on. Truly, this picture is God cares for us. Here's number six. God is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard a voice of the Lord... God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from among the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Uh, Do you remember when you were little 
and you heard maybe your mother or your father probably is more impactful when your father come home, comes home. I can come home and say, boys, and I can get their attention really quick. But it really carries more weight, doesn't it, when we know that we're guilty. Uh, maybe we've done something that we were told not to do. Uh, maybe we had done something and it just got out of control and we didn't intend it to be. Or maybe we just chose to make the wrong decisions. You and I know the difference between right and wrong, and so did Adam and Eve. And God was walking in the midst of the garden. And Adam and his wife were there. They heard the voice of the Lord God, and they hid themselves. You see, God is not someone who just rules from above. God is someone who is in every place. Just think about that for a minute. And there's another passage in the New Testament that tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. You see, God is not just somewhere which we cannot obtain. God cares for His people. God is omnipresent. Not only that, here's the seventh thing. God is holy. God is holy. It's Isaiah 6, 3. Isaiah 6, 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. It's in Isaiah 6 where we get this picture of the angels of which worship God. It's Isaiah who's in the presence of all of these things that are taking place. And it's God who asks the questions, who's going to go for us? And in verse 8, here am I, send me. The angels were reverent in the holiness of God. Isaiah was reverent in the holiness of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I need to understand that today, the day and age we live, God is still holy. And therefore, God standing in the, or Isaiah standing in the holiness of God, when he understood that God had a need, he says, Here am I, send me. You see, we're painting a picture of God, but what I really want us to do is also paint a picture of the things we need to do, here's one thing we need to do. If you want to do something that will help this world, you be ready for whatever situation you find yourself in. If it's to help someone, you help them. If it's to teach someone, you teach them. If it's just to hold their hand while they cry, you do that. You be there for whatever God has in store for you. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And in that scene, it was because he was in the presence of the holiness of God. Do you want to be in the holiness of God? I hope so. Here's number eight. God is love. It's 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. There is no doubt, I believe today, that anyone will question. Anyone who reads Scripture will question whether God is love. The very essence of who God is, is love. Passages like 1 John 4, 8. John 3, 16. Even when you go and see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. A terrible scene to see, but a wonderful scene to see. Why? Because that was done out of love. God is love. Now I want you to see something here about love. It's in 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. I want to ask you a kind of different question. I want to ask you, do you love? But let me ask you this. It's the same question. Do you know God? Because 1 John 4, 8, if you know God, you are a person who loves. Sometimes it's hard to love people, isn't it? But God is love, and as we paint that picture, we've got to be just the same. Here's the ninth. God is just. God is just. Psalm 89, 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. The psalmist here declares it just as it is, justice and judgment. God is going to judge. Did you know that? By the way, it's appointed a man once to die and after that, the judgment. And listen to this, it's Psalm 89, 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Do you want to be judged by a righteous God or a vengeance or a vengeful God? It's a just God that we want. As we paint this picture today, I want you to know something about eternity. God's going to be just in eternity. It's the habitation of His throne. 
So as we paint this picture, we're starting to understand something. I don't have anything to fear when it comes to the day of judgment because God is just. Here's our final one. It's from Romans 2, 3 through 4. God is good. God is good. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and does the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Here's the point. God's going to do what's right. He always has. He always will. You and I need to take it to heart today to know that God is good. God's going to take care of you. But let me tell you why. God expects you to take care of your fellow man as well. God is good. You see, as we've taken some color and we've tried to paint a picture of God today, what we've learned is God is amazing. God has done some things and God loves us and God cares for us. So here I ask you a question. It's just one single question. It's how we're going to conclude. It's how we're going to end because I want you to think about it over the next week, months, days. Do you and I want to paint a picture of ourselves so that we look more like God? You see, that's what we're trying to do. That's the focus that we're trying to give as we walk with the Word. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take God's Word, live it out in our lives so that we are more like Him. And ladies and gentlemen, let's do that. Let's take God's Word. Let's live it in our lives. And let's paint a picture of God, but let's make sure we look just like Him.